Good morning, Beach Fellowship. We're going to be looking into 1 Kings chapter 19 today. We're going to be talking to you in our first service about uh, new dimensions leading to new life. 1 Kings chapter 19, we're going to be picking up a story of the transference between Elijah and Elisha. And, uh, you know, you wonder sometimes, you read the scriptures, why did they have God, why did you have to make their names so similar, and sometimes you can get them confused, and so on and so forth. But really, in the essence of it is these are two powerful, very independent, rugged men who uh, worked hard, very different. Elisha comes from a very large family. Uh, Elijah, the Tishbite, nothing much is said about him and where he came from, but he was a, a rugged individualist. Uh, that God ultimately led to have a prominent role in the direction of the people of God. And then through that, God also led Elijah into complete transformation within his own life. It's a picture of you and me uh, through our own life as we're doing and following and walking with God in the newness of life. Uh, we discover a lot about ourselves. And then God's leading us on a collective journey of, of growth personally. And, and if you're a family, a family together and uh, also, though, he's taking you on the mission to the others, to people out in the world, and that's what happened with Elijah. But 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 19, just three verses. This is the time where Elijah is calling Elisha out to become uh, a follower of his, to be mentored by him, and ultimately to be the one who did take over. 1 Kings 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He was plowing in a, a field with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. All, all of these things matter. We're not going to uh, develop these thoughts completely today, uh, but he was with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So a yoke is, is, is that which joined uh, uh, animals together, to bring them together. Jesus said when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, he's actually talking about his teaching. It was the being yoked together with Christ, walking with Christ. You learn, my, my, my teaching is easy, my burden is light. But this yoking together, and Elisha is the last uh, guy plowing the last two in these rows. He went up to him and he threw his cloak around him. And Elijah then left his oxen, and, and he ran after Elijah. And he made this statement. He said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I'll come and uh, be with you. And Elijah says, kind of interestingly enough, go back. What, 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 what have I done to you? It's kind of like, you know, whatever, you know. I don't give no care. Um, anyway, uh, in verse 21, so Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to all the people, and they ate. And then, they set out to, and then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. I want to tell you a story for a moment, a real true story that happened in 2010, and then we'll come back to this and tie in this scripture portion for us today. Hector Tobar tells the story of a 33 Chilean miners who were trapped 2,300 feet below the surface for 69 days in 2010. Everybody remember that or have some sort of semblance of remembrance? It was in all the headlines. Uh, they, they had to live in the dark with almost no food. They were cut off from the rest of the world. Uh, during this experience, they began to lose weight. They, they didn't know if they would ever see daylight again. One newspaper in Santiago put their odds of survival at uh, 2%. Many of the miners, uh, face to face with imminent death, took stock of their lives, not, not uncommon for all of us. And then they, they realized they had a lot of regrets. Somebody in the mine asked Jose Enriquez, who was known as a, a religious guy in the group down there, if he would pray for everyone, and he did. He got down on his knees. Some of the other men joined him, and he just began to talk to God. We aren't the best of men, Lord. Have pity on us. You'd think that might be a little offensive, 
You know, who, who's he talking about? Not the best of men. But somehow in a deep, dark hole, no, none of these men objected because they knew it was true. So Hernandez went on, and he actually got a little more specific. Victor Segovia knows that he drinks too much. And now the guy's pointing his bony finger. Um, uh, he knows that he drinks too much. Uh, Victor must be a common name. Victor Zamora. He's too quick to anger. Pedro Cortez thinks about the poor father he's been to his young daughter. Again, through all of this, nobody objected. In fact, this was the beginning of something special that these men defined and described, something unanticipated. It was the beginning of a, of a fellowship, a bond. A, you want, might want to use the word an intimacy that began to take place over these 69 days while they're where they were. Somehow, being buried under the earth with death staring in them in the face, the men discovered a new sense of fellowship. They actually began to meet every day for their one meal. It was a spoonful of tuna, maybe a portion of a cookie, a little water. And then Jose Enriquez and Osman Araya would give a short sermon or teaching. And the men would get on their knees again and they would pray. God, forgive me for the violence of my voice before my wife and my son. God, forgive me for abusing the temple of my body with drugs. Amazingly enough, all of these things began to come out. They were extemporaneously, they were spontaneous, and they grew into times when the miners uh, apologized openly for their wrongdoings, even horizontally to each other, and practiced uh, mutual confession. I'm sorry I raised my voice. uh, I'm sorry I didn't help with the water. I'm sorry I said what I said to you. But we begin to realize through this story that fellowship essentially is shared experience. Suffering, by definition, means experiencing something we don't not want to experience, such as pain or loss or disappointment or despair. Uh, uh, By the way, nobody checks into the hospital on an ongoing basis because it's, oh, happy day, you know, I'm... I, I, I'm so thrilled. I got two tickets to uh, room 306 in the hospital. I'm going to go in there for a procedure. Uh, you know, you go in the hospital because the essence of a hospital is a hospitality and a place of healing. You go in with a need and hopefully you come out better, Lord willing. And yet this group of hardened miners found that their shared suffering, they actually started to care for one another. They formed a bond that Uh, never would have grown between them without this suffering, this situation. When they were cut off from the pursuit of their own life, uh, their pursuits of normal pleasure, uh, jobs, economic gain, money, uh, alcohol, and uh, they saw the folly of all of these things. And uh, all the while this is going on down below, meanwhile a group of people above the surface had begun to drill down through the earth to try to save them. The leader of the drilling crew said, as well, interestingly, hey, maybe we should pray for the hole that we're getting ready to dig. And as they bowed their heads, one of the team members said, hey, boss, can we hold hands as we pray? And and so these eight burly Chilean drill operators held hands and asked Jesus to help them. A rescue effort was born. People from all over the world began trying to help and give or pray. And we here in Virginia Beach, and I know we, we prayed and you hope and you give and you, know, and, you, and you pray for the men to be saved. Unfortunately, the happiest part of this story also becomes, in a twist, the saddest. The drill cuts a narrow hole through the rock. The miners start to daily get food. They start to get supplies. And oh yes, 21st century, they even got iPads. Uh, They knew now that they were eventually going to be rescued. They just need to be patient. And somehow word gets down to them that there's a really good chance that each one of them is going to get rich, financially enhanced by all the monies pouring in for them and their families and the interviews to come. 
And somehow the temperature of fellowship began to change. 2,300 feet below the surface. And I'll just give you this thought. They were at their best when life was at its worst. Now, it doesn't take me but a nanosecond to think of my own life sometimes. And that humility and uh, not feeling well and or, you know, just life sometimes pressures come and they come in such a way and it, it draws me nearer to God. It, 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 it calms my heart. It narrows down the, the multitude of things that I got popping in my head and in my heart and my hopes and my dreams. And all of a sudden, these guys are sitting there and, I mean, in a, in a second, I, I, I may never get out of 2,300 feet. I, don't need, I don't need, can't even describe that uh, exactly well how deep that is under the earth. But it does remind me of Deuteronomy chapter 8 when Moses is reminding the children of Israel. And the children of Israel are you and me. They're each one of us. Especially before we come to faith in Christ, but including after we become faith in Christ. If this isn't you, tell me. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses says these words from God. Be careful. First word, two words. Be careful. To follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live. That's God's hope. And we can live. You know, we're, we're born to live. We're, we're born to experience the goodness of God in the land of the living. We're born to show forth his praises. We're born to live lives, especially after Christ, to, to, to move in a direction that other people are actually attracted by versus being repelled by. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't opposition there isn't, doesn't mean there isn't people that are going to want to silence us and, and close our mouths and all the above, but, but they should know by the virtue of our face, our countenance, and our lifestyle that there's something different so that you can live, so that you can increase God's goal, and that you may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. The next main word. Remember, so first, be careful. Number two, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for 40 years. Who led them in the wilderness? God. How long were they supposed to be there? Most scholars would say 11 to 13, 15 days it was the journey. They stayed in the wilderness, the desert. Why? The Bible says because of the hardness of their heart. He said, you're not, you're not going into the promised land, the new place. After I just delivered you, you know, big sea opens up. They go through it, millions, enemies all covered up, gone. God's got a new plan. They're like, hoorah, we got gold, silver. We're on the other side. And within days, not, not weeks, what, what, what do the people of God do after those kinds of miracles? Complain about the leader. Moses, what did you do? It was better back there where we were for 430 years as slaves and all the mistreatment that fast. That's how quickly our synapses can be rewiring. And all of a sudden we change and all of a sudden the iPod, you know, comes down the hole with food. And we're reading, Barney. I know there wasn't a guy named Barney. Barney's one of my friends in preaching. Barney, man, hey, they're talking about they're raising millions of dollars. Yoo! Well, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, instead of looking at, man, the reality of fellowshipping in our sufferings and entering into the sufferings and being able to taste and tap into a whole new dimension of new life. Listen, in success, there's a dimension of God's grace. In suffering, there's a mention, dimensions of God's grace. And in serving, there's a dimension in God's grace. When you're, you're living our whole life, it includes all these things. And yet, it's usually not the worst of times that take us farther away from God. It's generally the worst of times that turns us a little bit back in the right direction. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness 40 years? And it was to humble you and to test you in order that you would know what was in your own heart. That's the real deal. We want God to prove himself to us all the time. We ask him, we talk to him, we, 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 we pray prayers that are, uh, mine were naive at best, but selfish at, 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 at the norm, the core. 
You know, how, how can this work out best for Ray Bjorkman? You know, you know, and I pray, and, you know, and then you discover there is the will of God, and, and then there's also times we don't know the will of God, but you begin to realize, Lord, you really aren't really after a relationship with me where I just come to you and say, hey, here's my next six requests. Thanks, peace, see you later. Right? I guarantee those guys prayed in their humility, God rescue me, and if I get out of this hole... I'll serve you. I'll do this, 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 this. And maybe all of them have. I don't know. But to humble and test you in order that you might know what's in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. In verse 3, this is interesting. God humbled you, causing you to hunger. It's, it's a natural biological thing for us to hunger. It's normal. But what did he do? He didn't leave us hungry. He didn't leave them hungry. He fed them with manna which neither you nor your ancestors knew. And I did it to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Feeding us with manna. We used to say that manna came from heaven and it fell down on the earth and they scooped it up and they ate it. But actually the scripture says the manna of God came down from heaven and fell on the dew that came every night on the earth to moisten the ground. The bread, the water, the life, the grace of God was being exemplified every day. And what did they do there ultimately? Nah, you know, I, man of potatoes, man of souffle. Keith Green had it the best when he talked about, you know, you whined and complained. He said, we want something else. And God says, what do you want? Well, we want some poultry. It got sent so many quail into there. And they began to gorge themselves with it so much so that the Bible says they vomited it all up. Because they just, yes, I got what I wanted. But they, they didn't realize that God was doing something in their lives. You know, rabbis have talked for many centuries, and they used to say that no one should receive the Torah, the Word of God, before they have experienced the manna, the love and care of God. And so, so the essence of that is, do, do we train up our children with the Word of God before they experience God? Absolutely. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about how so often the, the times we're just driving people to the Word of God, and they've never experienced God. The Bible says in the New Testament, the words of God are foolishness to those who are perishing. But the Word of God to us who are being saved is the power of God. It wasn't until I came to faith in Christ, experienced his love and care one night, receiving Christ, just like the Bible said, that all of a sudden then I had a hunger for the word of God. And his word, the entrance of his word began to explode in my heart and my life and in yours as well. People go, Pastor Ray, I have an insatiable appetite for the word of God. Good. Stay with it. Keep with it. That should be a lifelong process. But he finished by saying these as a reminder. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell during these 40 years. Miracle on top of miracle on top of miracle. God provided for them, protected them. Scorching heat in the day, he became a cloud over the sun, under the, underneath the sun. Cold at night, he became a pillar of fire every single night. 40 years, they've got to see that. The manifestation of the living God. You would think when you see that kind of miracle stuff, that you're obviously going to change and your heart's going to change. They didn't. So I question I ask you today, why is God forgettable? Why, why, why is he forgettable in our lives? Why is he forgettable in my life? You know, I mean, you know, he, he's not asking me to, when I'm driving down the road and trying to get in and out of traffic, he's not asking me to be focused on him at that nanosecond. Uh, that would be unwise, I've had a few times in my married life where Mary Alice and I are going somewhere or something, and I might, full confession, I might have a piece of paper out or something I'm trying to read or something I'm trying to watch. And it generally goes like this, Raymond, what? Are you, are you, are you reading that? No. No, 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 not me. Well, why did I see you just turn the page? Uh, you know, and there I am, conflicted, because, you know, basically uh, not, not being very truthful, right? 
But we forget the Lord not in that. We forget the Lord in the commitments that we forget to continue to make and renew daily. He's a daily God. It's a per diem walk. It's per day. It's our lifetime. It's the very same scripture that Jesus quotes later on when he's being tempted by the devil. And he says, hey, listen, hey, man can't live on bread alone. And bread, bread, bread relates to everything that sustains us in our life, which, by the way, is all finite. You can't live on all of that alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which is the infinite. The infinite coming into the finite enables us to put and parcel things in their right position. So back to Elijah. Elijah does something that's very important. Elijah, the older, the Elijah, the one who called Elisha. He does something very important. Number one, he gives Elisha room to make a commitment himself. He gives Elijah commitment room to be made by himself. It's the same way that Jesus Christ does with you and I. When he comes into the world, he doesn't arm bend. He doesn't force. He doesn't make you do it. He goes, hey, hey, can, can I go back and do this? Goes, yeah, go ahead. Do what you got to do. Because we are free moral agents. We are people that God has made. The only people that can make a promise in the world and keep a promise is people. The, the only part of creation. You don't, you don't see an animal going, hey, I promise I'll be here tomorrow, 8.47 a.m., you're hunting, <clears throat> Dwight, you're hunting, and, and I'm a 12-point buck, and I'm the biggest in all of the area. Dwight, I'll be here, I, I promise. Dwight's going, man, I'm going to sleep in a little bit, you know? And then I show up, and there, you know, it doesn't happen like that. But the, the people that we're called to be able to be is he gives Elijah room to make a commitment himself. Can I, can I go back home first? And Elijah says, Sure. And he goes back home. We, we, we don't, the Bible doesn't unpack a lot of that, doesn't go, dive into a lot of it. But the scripture says he, he was in this family, and he was in a fantastically wealthy family. Elisha was unlike Elijah in this way, in a big way. Elijah the Tishbite had nothing hardworking. Elisha from Shabbat, he he had everything. And yet, of these people... And of the men of Israel, Elijah said, I'm going to throw my cloak, which is significant of the call of God, on you and say, hey, you want to come and be my servant? Number two thought today, any good commitment that will have the strength to last must be freely offered. Parents, how many of you know what we're talking about? How many of you to use a, a hot topic today, quid pro quo, with your kids. If you do this, I'll do that. How many of you do the other thing and find yourself, which we talk about in, in greater detail, how many of you find yourself when your little one is doing something wrong, you go, if you do that one more time, and, and you're not going to get this. I mean, go ahead, stick your hand up just a little bit, just a, just a little bit, you know, right? So we're going to remove the, 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 the thing uh, because we're trying to motivate their behavior. There's aspects of that where it's appropriate, but not a lot. But also spouses. I don't know how many times we sit and we talk with people, just relational counseling, talking, talk from the pulpit, but one spouse removes their affection from the other. Well, it's never been like this before, but all of a sudden now it's da 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 and did you notice I said da 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 so I'm not getting into the details here in the weeds? But the reality is this. Hey, don't, we don't need to be doing that. We don't, we don't need to be using these things as, as games. We have to be realizing that these are freely offered. When we offer ourselves to our spouses in marriage, we freely give ourselves in all aspects of covenant love. We freely give ourselves one to another in mutuality in the church. We freely love one another because Christ has first loved us. Our commitment is by the strength that God supplies. Any commitment you make, and I, I could have titled this message, A Thousand Commitments. There's a couple that are overarching. They're the macro. They're the big ones. 
And the, and the rest of them are what Mary Alice and I choose to do every day, next year being 40 years being married. You choose every day to renew those commitments every day. Parenting. Uh, what was the book that Dobson put out years ago? Parenting's not for cowards. Oh, holy mackerel, that's an understatement. Parenting, and the reality of it is, is you going to sleep, trying to get some rest if you can, and you wake up the next day and it's a new day. And, and as parents, we're, we're not trying to bring yesterday's not healthy behavior by your little one or ones, and, and we're not trying to bring that in today and all of a sudden let you start off your day with angst. You're trying to hit control, alt, delete, knowing this is a long series of interactions, <coughs> fellowship between you and your child. But Elijah offers him this opportunity. No pressure, no manipulation, no emotional appeal. He didn't say, hey, come on, man, I'm, I'm throwing the mantle of God on you, the call of God. This is the biggest uh, promotion opportunity ever. Do you know what you're going to make? No, he just doesn't, he just throws it out there. The commitments we make must come from the core of who we are, or eventually they crumble under pressure. How many of you would agree life will bring pressure? All right, Genesis chapter 5, God names two cre parts of creation. She says, and there are secrets within them, birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Both of them have something within them in their core that enables fish to go down to the depths and deal with the pressure. You and I would have to put on scuba gear, mask, bells, housing. The farther you go, you got to be in a, in, a, in a submarine. Not fish. At their core, God put something in there. So he's describing something. They can deal with their environment. Number two, birds of the air can fly. They can soar. Ready to, to, to move. They, they, they flap their wings. And guess what? When the wind is blowing, there's no need for flapping. It speaks of the Spirit of God moving in our life. But they can soar. And what do they do? They transgress and ascend and supersede the, the law of gravity. They're, they're both of these things are what I call godly lawbreakers. And God names them in Genesis chapter 5. Of all the things he could have named, he names the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Why? Because of that. In the core of you and the core of me is your commitment to Christ. The core is the beginning of it. It needs to be revisited. It needs to be gone back to. It needs to be reminded of you. Remember the writer in the book of Revelations? He said, listen, God said to me to the churches, repent, change your thinking, and, and return to where you have fallen, the high place of your first love. What's our first love? When we connected with God with love and grace and he wooed us. And, and, and the night I came to faith, it was like, are you kidding me? I mean, I've never been enveloped and filled and flooded and overflowing with the, this kind of love. And this is exactly what I've been looking for all my life. And I, I wish I could have bottled it. How many can say amen? How many of you wish you that day, take me back, dear Lord, to the time when I first received you? The real, reality is for us, God says there's, there's other commitments right along the way. There's a commitment to become an obeyer not just a follower. Remember Jesus, when he ordained 12, the Bible says in the New Testament, he went up and he prayed all night and he came down and he ordained 12 men to be with him. Doesn't say anything else. He didn't, it didn't say he ordained him to be apostles then, to be great disciples, to be super awesome dudes. No, he ordained 12 to be with him. He's ordained you to be with you, to be with him. He ordained you to be with him. He ordained you first to become a son or a daughter of Almighty God. He ordained you first to be part of his family, to be brought into his relational place where he is so that at the core of you are, when we're tested in life, when pressure comes, when things happen, we're able to go forward because of his goodness. Jesus wants us to experience him first. Like the rabbi said, Jesus said, come all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He said, take my teaching upon you and learn of me. My, my teaching is different than what you've heard. It's not going to be this heavy handed pressure, uh, manipulation, things have to happen. No, it's going to be a whole different deal. And Elijah's gift to Elijah was, you go do what you got to do. 
you make a good decision yourself, and when you make a commitment, then come on, let's go do something together. When Elijah goes home, he does one last thing to confirm his commitment. He slaughters the two oxen that he had, uses the wood from the plow to light a fire, and and he has a massive uh, banquet for himself. And then he sets out to follow Elijah and become his servant. He burns the plow, he kills the oxen, he's all in. There's no looking back. You know, oftentimes there's a story told when uh, in 1519 when Cortez landed in Mexico with 11 ships, 500 soldiers, 100 sailors to pursue the glory of the new world. They get there uh, with these 500 men, these 11 ships, and you've you've heard the story, I'm sure, and it's often used in, in business or motivational speaking or something, and they get there and and uh, they, they come on shore, and they bring all the provisions on shore, and they unload the boats and everything. And Cortez turns, and he gives the command, burn the ships. They're in a new world. They're, they're in a whole new dimension. They're going to have a new life. But in his great thinking, creative genius, or his maniacal maniac kind of thing, he said, burn them all. And what was he saying? Guys, that's not our back door. That, that, that's not our back door. We have no back door. Our front door is us and a fellowship that will develop from these 500. The creativity, we can't in, 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 in entail all that it's going to take. But we're going to come together. And some of you are going to have incredible gifts that none of the others have. And others, you, everybody has something to add. And what do they do? Explore the whole new world. We're not talking about that kind of a thing with Elijah. We're not talking about you need to make some superhuman, burn it all, torch it all, follow him. We're talking about an inner commitment at the core of your being. When did you make the decision to follow Jesus? When did you receive him? When did he come inside of you? When did you say, yes, I'll follow you? And did you say, I'll follow you? Yes, I'll go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm following you. And if you haven't, you should. Because what Jesus said was, listen, I'm going to come and live inside of you. And you know what happens? He wants you to experience his love and care first. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and and, and maybe even you're a Christ follower, and just struggling with, just keeps going. He says, can I give you rest? Can Can I give you peace? Okay. Can I show you a new dimension of you? How often and how long? I'm... We've lived in our lives, and we're charging along because, you know, that's where I've been taught, and that's how I work, and I'm diligent, and we do our things, and and, and we go on, and all of a sudden, you're like, hey, the lug nuts are a little loose, and you can hear that soft sound of the whisper. Hey, Ray, that's a lot of flapping going on. How about you take a little bit of rest? Lord, I can't. I got a lot, tons going on right now, Lord. Yeah, I just want you to come away with me. I ordained you to be with me. I want you to be with me. I want you to rest. Lord, I would, but I got a lot of stuff going on right now. And, and, and you know, he's not going to arm bend me. He's not going to make me stop. He's going to let me just go pedal, 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 tongue hanging out. Ah, Lord, nobody loves me, you know. And, and, and then he's going to go, same message. How would you like to come be with me? Spend some time with me a little more. It's called a Sabbath. It's, it's a little bit of a break. Jesus is the Sabbath. He's in us. He, he wants to fill us with his peace and love so we know his care and love. So then we go back to his word, and his word, he, it's just simple. A little bit of the word, and I, I'm just motivated, and I'm, I'm changed, and I'm, I'm driven, and I'm led. And some of the things have to do with us letting go of the timeline we put on God. We, we're, we're just terrible about this all the time, just expecting God to do something within a certain time frame. It doesn't happen. And then we are what? Frustrated with God. We're upset with God. And you're like, really? The creation talk to the creator like that or are acting like that? I I just don't think that scripture really means that. Oh, why? Well, because I I prayed for years. It didn't really happen. Well, maybe you prayed amiss, the Bible says. Maybe it still hasn't happened yet in it's going to come. We inherit promises through faith and patience. Sometimes you pray, and it's like, bam. You know, how, how many love nanosecond prayer answers? Yeah, come on now, 
right? Microwave, yeah, boom. But a lot of this stuff is being worked out in a process called life, and I better quit. Haven't been here in a couple weeks. You're going to toss me out of here. Lastly, last thought today. Elisha expresses physically what he is offering personally and spiritually. If you, if you want to enter into some of the new dimension, the new life of, of God, maybe you haven't taken that next step to express physically that spiritual commitment. He, he literally goes public in a big way. Uh, when we do weddings, uh, we remind the people that are there, they're there as what? Witnesses to this covenantal commitment, this, this expression of love. When people come to a new faith in Christ, you know, we encourage lovingly, tell somebody. Tell somebody outside of the safe zone. You know, you tell another Christian, how hard was that? Not very. You know, uh, but tell somebody that didn't know before, oh, they might reject me. Yeah, maybe. They might think I'm goofy. Yeah, maybe. But if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father in heaven. And when you do that, you enter into a new dimension. You're like, man, that was not bad. Pastor Ray, they want to come to church next week. I'm like, go figure. You know, you invite somebody. You, 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 you be that kind of person. People begin to realize whatever you're doing professionally, whatever you're doing educationally, whatever you're doing in the journey and life stage right now, God is with you, and, and he wants to demonstrate his love through you, his loving care. But he might also be asking us, <coughs> to uh, do something publicly. So I'm going to stop today. Uh, Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this just God-loving, wonderful group of people, Beach Fellowship, your church. Thank you for our guests who are here in our first service today. Thank you for those who are members, regular attenders. God, thank you for uh, the newness of life that has come through relationship with your son, Jesus. Lord, you came and you gave it all. In every generation, Lord, you've given it all and you will continue to give it all because that's all you know. You are forever God and you change not. You are forever faithful because that's who you are. And Lord, we say to you today, may our lives be enhanced with the commitment we have made to you in the past. May our lives be enhanced by the commitment we remake to you every day. God, strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit in our inner man that we might know better the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of the love of God which surpasses anything that we will know in this life. Lord, leading us and guiding us as groups of people and individuals and to people who say we are championing the cause of the kingdom of God on earth because the king lives in us. Lord, bless us and may your Holy Spirit empower us today and every day more and more that we might share who you are and demonstrate who you are. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, amen. amen.